Good afternoon, and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Attempts to Pronounce More Sanskrit While Teaching You Logic. The next step in our historical, in our path through the history of the development of Buddhist argument and reasoning is a guy called Dignaga. He lived around about 480 to 540 and both built on and expanded Vasubandhu's foundations. He was an extremely, uh, in another extremely influential person in the development of logic. Unfortunately, we don't have many of his works and many of his works that we do have are not yet translated into English. So it's not very accessible unless you are an actual Sanskrit or Tibetan or Chinese scholar. Instead of looking at what Dignaga himself actually has to say, we're going to look at the work of somebody who is said to be a student of him. Now, whether this person was actually like literally studied with Vasubandhu or whether he was maybe a student of a student or something is you know, not very important. What's important is that in the work that we have of his, which is translated into English very conveniently, we have a very nice account of Dignaga's developments. So this person is, drum roll please, if I can get the stress on all of the syllables right, his name is Sankarish Vaman. Now let me write down both his name and Dignaga so that you can see exactly how to do it with all of the diacritics and everything. So the first person that we are talking about is Dignaga and the person whose work that we are going to specifically be discussing is this fellow, Sean Karasva Min. There you have it. Complicated Sanskrit, hope you enjoy it. You'll remember from Vasubandhu that we had in his system, we had the three-step argument form and the Trirupa Hetu. The next sort of development is incorporating aspects of the Trirupa Hetu into the three-step argument. Now you remember that the first one, the assertion that the Hetu actually appears in the Paksha is already part of the three-step argument. So why not make the other parts also explicit formal features of the argument in order to ensure that you've got a good Hetu? So this is one of the developments that we can attribute to Dignaga and uh, through people like Shankar Svaman. And that is, the introduction of something called the example, or let me write out the Sanskrit word and then say it. So, D R S T A. All right, there you go. You've got four consonants, three of which have dots underneath them. This is the Durstanta, or the introduction of an example. Now, we already even saw this in the classic example with sound being non-eternal and the example of the pot. That is a dirshtanta. What is relevant in, what is important in these contexts is that this stage of the development added the dirshtanta to the three-step argument as an explicit step. It's a, an explicit characteristic, not just something that you can say, add, to give your, your audience an understanding. It's like, oh yeah, like a pot. It becomes a formal feature of the argument. So here are two examples of arguments that follow this kind of augmented form. So the three-step argument plus the Durstanta. So we start off with our thesis that sound is non-eternal. So this is what we want to prove. So sound is our paksha and non-eternal is our sadhya. Then you have the statement of the, uh, um, sorry, of the ground. And that is here because it arises from effort. So that takes care of the first characteristic of the Trirupa Hetu. And then we have the statement of the concomitants, whatever is produced from effort or arises from effort is non-eternal, but we add to that 
the Durstanta. So explicitly now, the example is part of the argument form. So whatever results from effort is observed to be non-eternal like a pot. So this is the same example that we saw in Vasubandhu, but there's two things to note. First, as I've said a couple of times, this like a pot bit is now expressly part of the three-step argument. You don't just have concomitants, you have concomitants plus Durstanta. The other thing that's interesting is that we have this is observed to be. So this is a slight hedging of bets from the previous articulation of this example and falls back onto this notion that we are working with potentially revisable conclusions. So it could be that right now, we have only ever is observed this concomitance between production from effort and non-eternality. So we're talking about this is what we've observed. Now, maybe somebody will come along at some point and give us an example of, uh, of something that is produced as a result of effort, but is not non-eternal, that is eternal. In which case, we might have to revise our belief in this thesis but that's okay. That is part of what this system of reasoning is for. Recall that this is an instrument of knowledge or a means of giving justification to our knowledge claims. Until somebody comes along and gives us an example of something contrary to this observation, we are justified in maintaining this thesis on the basis of this ground, this concomitant, and this Durstanta. All right, I'm going to clear everything from here to go through another example. This is another very classic example that turns up in many different uh, authors and contexts. So here our thesis is, there is fire on the mountain. So the idea being, we are over here sitting in front of our computers. And over here off in the distance, we have a mountain and I'm going to make some inference about this mountain over here. I am going to argue that there is fire on this mountain. Why? I can give a statement of the ground and that is because there is smoke. So if you look over at the mountain, you'll see there's all sorts of smoke coming out of it. So I'm going to conclude from that, that there is fire. Why? Because there is smoke, but more importantly, I can justify a connection between smoke and fire through the concomitance, which is that wherever there is smoke, there is fire. And I can give a Durstanta, like in a kitchen. This is, of course, a positive one. It says, here's a place where you have both smoke and fire occurring together, but I can also give a negative Durstanta in this case. I can say, unlike a lake. A lake is a case where there's neither smoke nor fire. So the, the, the ground gets us the first aspect of the Trirupa Hetu. The positive Durstanta gets us the second one. The negative Durstanta gets us the third. It says, look, this is you know, smoke doesn't occur in places where there is not fire. So with all of this together, I can look, I can look across, you know, maybe I'm looking across that lake. There's a beautiful lake in there. And there's no smoke coming out of that lake. There might be steam, there might be mist, but it's not smoke. And over in my kitchen, it's too much fun drawing little pictures. There's my stove and oh no, something has gone terribly wrong. I've got fire in my kitchen and I've also got smoke. Maybe my partner's in there cooking. 
who knows? So as I said, this particular example is incredibly common. You find there is fire on the mountain because there is smoke all over the place. One interesting thing about this uh, example is that you are not reasoning from fire to smoke because you can have fire without smoke. It's going essentially backwards. So not from cause to effect, but from effect to cause. Because we can see smoke and we know that smoke comes from fire, by observing smoke on the mountain, we know that it has to be the case that there is in fact also fire. Now, of course, there's more to the story than just adding these gestanta. But I hope that you can see how the incorporation explicitly into the three-step argument of positive and negative drishtanta moves towards incorporating everything into the structure of the argument that you need to ensure that you have a good argument. So Vasubandhu gave us the three steps and said, okay, but your hetus also have to meet these requirements in order for it to be good. At Dignaga's stage, so he and his followers started integrating these two into a single example. So, or, or into a single structure so that the examples are incorporated into it. Uh, the next time we're going to say more about this use of the positive and negative Durstanta and incorporate this into kind of a broader theory of reasoning about when do you have good arguments of this form and when do you not. So take care and join me next time and we'll talk more about this because there's loads to be said. Cheers. <laughs>